Are you familiar at all with these books? They're obviously children's stories. They're written by a woman named Laura Numeroff. If you give a pig a pancake, if you give a dog a donut, if you give a mouse a cookie, there's two more in the series that I'm aware of. If you give a moose a muffin, and if you give a cat a cupcake. They're kind of cute stories, kind of funny little stories. The gist of each of these stories is if you give someone something as simple as a pancake, they're not only going to want the pancake, but the syrup. And as soon as they start eating the pancake and the syrup, especially if it's a pig, they're going to get sticky. And when they get sticky, they're going to want to take a bath. And when they take a bath, they're going to see their rubber ducky. And the rubber ducky is going to remind them of the farm. They're going to want to go visit the farm. But to go visit the farm, they've got to find the suitcase. But when they look for the suitcase, they find the tap shoes. When they put on the tap shoes, of course, they want a ballerina dress. And once they have the ballerina dress and the tap shoes, they want a photo shoot. And once they take a photo shoot, of course, they're going to send those pictures to their friends. So when they go out to the mailbox and mail them off, they see a tree. And when they see a tree, well, of course, they want to build a tree house. And when you build a tree house, of course, you want to line the interior walls with wallpaper. And while you're mixing the wallpaper paste, it's sticky and it reminds you of the syrup and you want another pancake. A pig, a moose, a mouse, a cat, a dog. Each of them in those stories wants something more. What they have isn't enough. What they have isn't good enough. It may be for a time until they get distracted and they see something else and then they gotta have that. They gotta have something bigger. They gotta have something better. They gotta have the best. They're never satisfied. They're never content. Now, as we gather together as a congregational family, a church family and friends to celebrate Thanksgiving, I'm not here today to call you a moose or a pig or a mouse and I'm not trying to say I'm a cat or a dog. But maybe we can relate. Maybe we can relate with Laura Numeroff. And maybe we can admit that we don't know the secret of being content. You want to know the secret? You want to know the secret of being content? Because the Apostle Paul just told us what it is. The secret of being content is not found in what we have. Even though, ironically enough, that's so often where we look for our content in what we have. The Apostle Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or being in want. Paul could be content in every situation, whether he had a lot or a little, whether he was rich or poor, whether he had plenty or whether he was in want, because he found his contentment not in what he had. The Apostle Paul understood that things come and go. Things can be received, things can be earned, things can be purchased, things can be built, things can be simply given. But things can also be lost, things can be stolen, things can be destroyed, things can be burned, things can be buried. Things come and go. Sometimes unexpectedly. Sometimes the writing was on the wall and we knew this was coming. Sometimes suddenly. And sometimes drawn out over time. Sometimes through no fault of our own. And sometimes through our own negligence. Things come and go. So if we seek to find our contentment in what we have, we will never be happy. We will never be happy because things are constantly changing. And not only are things constantly changing, but we'll never be happy because we never change. This side of heaven. This side of heaven will always be who we are. By nature, selfish, greedy, materialistic. We're like that little boy in the toy store who just has 
to have this toy right now to the point of throwing a tantrum if he doesn't get it only to get the toy, take it home, play with it once, and have it buried under all the other must-have for. The world around us convinces us that we deserve this. Our envy of those around us convinces us that we have to have that in order to keep up. Our own sinful flesh convinces ourselves that in order to be happy, we have to have these, and as many of these as possible. We find our contentment in things. We might be happy for a time until we see the next big thing. And our eyes are drunk. We've got to have something bigger, something better, something new. Or until we look again at our neighbor, at what he just bought, and said, "Yeah, we've got to have the same." Or when we when we start to scratch that itch that our old Adam brings to the surface. This is a generalization. Generalizations always have ex exceptions to the rule. So take it for what it's worth here. But follow the line of. Thing. Generally speaking, people's expenses generally tend to keep up with their income or <coughs> the expenses surpass the income, which is why people are in debt. But think of it, if we could just live today like we lived 10 years ago, on the salary that we have today, what would that do to our family budget? I know things change, and I know families grow, and I know kids eat more food, and I know. But generally speaking, there'd be a little more wiggle room. There a little more for God, a little more for the future. But the problem is, we can't live how we lived 10 years ago today, because how we lived 10 years ago is no longer good enough for us. With each increase in pay, with each salary raise, we needed more things, newer cars, bigger houses. If you give a sinner a paycheck, see how that goes. Now maybe we can think to ourselves, times when we, and maybe that time is now, we need to scrimp and save, and we're scratching to get by, and it's pretty easy to realize, I haven't been content, even with what God has given me. I know I want more. But maybe, like Paul said, I know what it's to have little, I know what it's to have plenty, maybe then, maybe there's times, and maybe that's right now when we do we have plenty, but even now, is the plenty good enough? It's just how clever Satan is, and how deceptive the world is, and how naive our old Adam is to believe in the eyes that we're going to be content with what we have. But the secret of being content isn't in what Secret of being content. Are you ready for it? Secret of being content is found in who we have. Who do we have? We have a God who loves us. We have a God who protects us. We have a God who takes care of us. We have a God who provides for us. We have a God who saved us. We have a God who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all. We have a God who is willing to make himself nothing. Willing to take on the very nature of a servant. Willing to take on human flesh. Willing to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. We have a good shepherd who is willing to become the sacrificial lamb. We have a high priest who is willing to become an offering for our sin. We have a glorious king who is willing to be scorned with shame and crowned with thorns and robed with our guilt and nailed to a cross. We have a redeemer who is willing to shed his blood to purchase us for God and to wash away all of our unrighteousness. We have a redeemer who is willing to endure punishment so that we could have peace, to suffer hell so that we could enjoy heaven, to die so that we could live. We have a savior who crushed the serpent's head, who swallowed death up in victory, and who freely forgives us our sins. And right now, right now he's at God's right hand, and he's in 
interceding for us. He's speaking to the Father in our defense. Right now, He's ruling all things for our eternal and our spiritual good. Nothing happens to us in life without His first knowledge or approval. Right now, we have someone in heaven who's already taken His power and begun to reign. Right now, He's sending the Holy Spirit into our hearts through word and sacrament. Right now, the one who brought us to faith is nurturing our faith and tending our faith and making our faith stronger. Right now, the one who gave us the eyes of faith is constantly redirecting our eyes back to Christ, keeping our eyes fixed on Him, the author and perfecter of our faith. Right now, the one who adopted us into God's family is constantly reminding us that we are still dearly loved children of God. Right now, the one who brought us to faith, who keeps us in faith, who strengthens our faith, has given us the willpower, the desire, the commitment, the drive, the want to, to drown our old Adam in daily contrition and repentance so that each day a new man can arrive. It's from the dead to live before God in righteousness. When our contentment is not in who we have, not in what we have, it doesn't matter if we have a lot or a little, if we're rich or we're poor. Because we have a Heavenly Father who's powerful and kind and gracious and caring. When we find our contentment in who we have rather than in what we have, it won't matter whether we're sick or healthy, whether we're strong or weak. Because we have a Savior who lived for us, who died for us, who rose for us. He's working everything for us. When we find our contentment in who we have rather than in what we have, it won't matter if we're young or old, if we're all alone or married, if we're divorced or widowed. Because we have the promise of God the Holy Spirit to give our lives, to give us meaning and purpose and identity and direction and guidance. God has given us so much more than a pancake or a cupcake. He's given us more than we could ever ask for or ever even imagine. He's given us himself. And if we have him, and we do, then we already have everything we 